Lawrence Miller, welcome to Electronic Music Life. Thanks a lot, James. Great to see you. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a minute. Last time we saw each other was in Saudi last year. <laughs> yeah, almost a year ago. I know, I know. Are you uh, heading over there this this coming this um, coming up now? Like in at the end of the month? Uh, I won't be. No. Um, the yeah, I know that the the conference is starting. I think at the end of November, but I, I'm not able to make it this year. Yeah, yeah. Likewise. Um, yeah, look, I, I'm really glad that uh, you're able to join me. I, I wanted to um, sort of, uh, you know, talk a bit about your involvement. You've been in the music industry um, for for twenty odd years now, and you've, um, yeah, you've, yeah, you've like it. We've um, done similar kind of things, or, or you know, but in different parts of the world. And I'm intrigued by. Um, learning more about it. Like, first of all, you were uh, working in, like, working with events and um, there's some uh, label work. Tell us a little, give us a bit of an intro of uh, the early part of your career. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty interesting one. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the, the fine examples of coming into the music industry without any real experience of, of ever being involved in it. Um, and I think that's the magic of, of you know what the music industry brings right is is kind of allows allows people who who have got in, interest in or, or love of music or love of people to to kind of find their way in somehow so i uh, i moved to london in in uh, 2000 just after i went to university in southampton in the uk and kind of came to london and yeah it was just like well what is this huge beast of a city and and didn't really know how to find my way into you know into the city into this new world um and really you know my love of music kind of allowed me to find interesting ways into you know communities and meeting people and and you know different events and things like that and and i think you know from a, a you know i came from a small town in australia called Mackay, and you know like I don't know, it's just sort of, it just opened up this whole new world of possibilities, really. Um, and, and yeah, you know, found found a cool crowd of people to kind of, you know, kind of go out the weekend, live for the weekend kind of thing. And, you know, we started uh, started doing some events in East London in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, just small crowd of people, small bars that we could get our hands on, you know, where they had a late license and we could sort of, you know, get our mates together and, and invite them to come and come and hang out. Um, I had a friend of mine, his name's Demi. Uh, he, he's the kind of, yeah, I guess he's still a, a sort of renowned DJ in the sort of progressive house and, and, and house scene. Um, and we started doing nights together, uh, inviting some of his friends up to London for the weekend. Um, James Abelia, Danny Howells, Lee Burridge. These kind of guys, and you know, this was like early two thousands. You know, like the, the I guess the bedrock days of the heady progressive house kind of era, um, uh, and yeah, just kind of just found a love of bringing people together and giving them a sense of freedom in in you know what was a pretty tough city to live in at the time, certainly for me anyway. Uh, and and yeah, sort of from there, you know, kind of learned how to put on events and learn how to kind of you know, run around London, you know, kind of putting up flyers and, you know, posters on train stations and under carriageways and things like that. And it was just like, it was just a, a sort of, it was a life away from the norm, really. Um, and, and then, yeah, so, so I guess from there, that was my entry into the music industry. Um, you know, we started a small record label called Deeper Substance Records, where we would just be, you know, we had no idea how to release, you know, records. We had no idea how to run a label. You know, we were we were printing vinyl and you know, kind of promoting to our friends and doing what we could to to sort of get the name out there. Um, and again, it was just really fun, you know, meeting people from all over the world and you know, inviting them to come and play at our nights. And that was really, you know, just a, an amazing opportunity to to get yeah, bring people together and and show that there was a different a different way of living aside from you know the kind of the daily nine to five kind of grind i guess 
Um, and then, yeah, so from running events and running a label, you know, the, the arrogant kind of mid twenties, you know, kind of man in me was just like, well, great. I know the music industry now. So let's start managing bands and, and, and let's start going out there to the, to the music industry and, and telling them that we know what we're doing. And, and of course we didn't know what we were doing at all. Um, but you know, it was sort of, again, like it's, it's, it's an amazing place, the music industry, because creativity comes from, from all sides. Right. And, and, and there aren't really any rules, you know I mean? I guess now there are, you know, thousands of, of, you know, music business courses online and, you know, how to run a record label, YouTube videos. And, you know, like there's so much resource out there that allows people to, to kind of find their way through. But I think, you know, back then, I say back then, was this like, you know, 2007, 2008, you know, it was kind of, you know, you learn by doing and you learn by going out there and putting your life on the line to sort of say, hey, I've got this artist, do you want to sign them? You know, they're going to be the next big thing. You know, they're playing here, they're playing there, they're releasing here. And, you know, just kind of building the hype, you know, yeah. based on, on my belief of, of how well they were going to do, but ultimately, you know, not really knowing, you know, and I think that's, again, the beauty of music, right, is, is it's not really based on the commercial success of things. It's just like how much you love something, how much you believe in it, and, and how much you want to create success for, for, you know, for that band or that DJ or, or that release. And, and, and ultimately to try and, you know, kind of make a living from that. Um, so yeah, it's been, you know, I mean, the, at the early part of my career anyway, was, was very much DIY and very much kind of, you know, live by the seat of your pants and, and really try and kind of do your best in, in, in the big world out there. Um, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. and, and it's great to sort of see more and more of those kind of, you know, people coming through and artists coming through and, and DIY artists coming through and the resources that are available now that, that we didn't really have, um, which, which I think is, is an amazing thing for the music industry now. You know, the demo, democratization of, of the music industry, I think, is a, is a really powerful thing as well. Do you think? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, I, I found that there's, I guess there's two sides of the coin here with, with the accessibility of that information now that, that's available to people. Um, to there's obviously so much information which can be very overwhelming, and um, but it's also like um, from people from our generation, that early part were um, I guess learning from up where we could learn from I guess from a lot of independent artists artists that were doing it say ten years before and trying to model that in the sort of dance music space or um and you know sort of and it is it was it was completely diy and i think it it that whole diy still element is there however yeah and to try to keep that to keep that essence i think is super important um but i think the monetization um structures are a bit more available and accessible now like being able to understand what's possible and being able to like, you know, work out projections. I think we never had that before. I don't think we did have that. Like we were just kind of like, you know, see what's stuck on the, see it, throw it in the wind and see what's stuck, you know. Um, oh, but, always, yeah. <laughs> and look, I think there is no guarantee still today, no matter how much you've got your strategies and, and structures in place, there's no, you know, um, magic you know, bullet that's going to, to, to make it. I guess the thing is that you, 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 you do it anyway for the love. And that's, that's like, and you, and you try to create income streams around that, you know, um, and, you know, one of the biggest things that I wanted to touch with you about is, um, I'm finding the whole web three space is becoming more and more of a way for, uh, artists to, um, uh, create their community, create money, you know, monetization, um, uh, you know, streams. And that, is this a space that you're diving into now as well? Yeah, I, it's, it's really interesting, actually. Um, you know, one of the things I touched on before you know, about sort of 
you know, starting a record label and, you know, promoting events and things like that without necessarily, I mean, this was even before Facebook, you know, we were trying to, 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 you know, to create our own community, right? And, you know, I knew for sure that, you know, if I got my, you know, if I got my event listing in time out at the weekend or I got a review on Resident Advisor for one of our releases, you know, I knew that it would get us, you know, some exposure and, and amplify what we were doing to some extent. But really, you know, what I what I learned there was, you know, your our supporters, you know, were from our own community, and you know, the people that were going to buy the vinyls, yeah, there were, you know, our small community of DJs who, you know, followed the label and, you know, wanted to see what what was coming out next, and whether we got, you know, sort of DJ reviews or, you know, kind of, um, you know, did club promo and got like, you know, feedback from different DJs on the releases that we had coming up. You know, it was kind of, we worked so hard on the promo and actually what I realized is that, you know, sort of nurturing the community and spending time and effort in doing that was, was you know, the impact and the engagement was so much stronger than, you know, kind of getting a, a timeout listing or a resident advisor review to some extent. And I think now with the, the Web3 side of things, it's kind of like, it's, 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 for me anyway, it, it feels like it's gone full circle. In the, you mm. know, like now mm. artists and labels and, you know, event brands and whatever, they have the opportunity to kind of, you know, create their own space to, to nurture those communities again. And, mm. and, and I think that, that, you know, yeah, the Web3 kind of model and, and system allows people to, to take ownership of that. Um, you know, we always used to say, I w- would always give advice to, to artists or DJs that I was working with or promoting that, you know, they would be like, yeah, you know, like we've got to like build up our Instagram following or our Facebook numbers or this and that and the other. And, and it was kind of like, well, why would you do, you know, I mean, I found the first band that I managed clock opera on my space, you know, and, and again, the, the kind of, you know, we need to build our my, MySpace followers. And, and it was always like, well, why would you put the power of your community into the hands and onto a platform that you have no control over? And, mm. you know, like, you know, MySpace kind of died away and Facebook kind of has died away to some extent. And, you know, like these bands and, you know, labels and promoters would have, you know, thousands and thousands of followers and all of a sudden it's disappeared because you know, the population has moved on, right? Mm. And I think with Web3, it allows, it allows artists to, to take control again of, of their, you know, of the power of nurturing their own communities. Um, I think really, you know, the, the ultimate power is still having, you know, a really strong email, you know, email list. And, you know, WhatsApp group, for example. Um, you know, yeah, where you yeah. have the telephone numbers and you have the, the direct contacts of the community who you want to engage because, you know, yeah, of course, you've got to rely on, on WhatsApp, but, you know, as a platform, but also, and, you know, yes, email, will it go away? Maybe, but, you know, you have so much more control there. And I mm. think that the, the power and the possibilities of Web3 allows people to, to take control of their own communities and nurture their own communities again instead of putting the power into, you know, Instagram and into Facebook and, mm, and you, know, yeah. you know, TikTok and whatever is coming next. And, and I think, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, the power of someone's community is, is more powerful than TikTok because if you have a, an amazing TikTok, TikTok channel or an incredible Instagram channel, you know, then the, the, the possibilities for reaching engagement, you know, is going to be, you know, really powerful. But I think that, you know, that's, they've got to be tools within, you know, your overall kind of ecosystem of, of connecting and bringing in your communities. Um, mm. So I think mm. Web3 allows, allows people to start thinking like that again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I, look, you, you, you bring up some good points there because what, what crossed my mind as you were talking was that, like, my head went into the, the like, that whole full circle, but it, well, you can go as far back as say early nineties when say Jeff Mills, um, or even, even, uh, uh, the Beastie Boys 
with their label, with, with when they started their own label and having that sort of direct, you know, mailing lists and yeah. um, and nurturing the, their their uh, existing databases that they had control over. And yeah. I think I think like we've been so kind of like we got conditioned, kind of lost that thinking that we could d- use. Use and I guess it's just I guess the part of the evolution. But you're right; it, it's sort of bringing back using technology, but also creating more of a nurturing um, dynamic with with the the community again. And the, I, I see yeah. that, yeah, I see that uh, being um, you know more relevant than um, and like, yeah, and I agree. Like, it's not to say we don't use web to stuff um and we don't use you know the the social media but um finding more ways to to communicate with our with our community and and nurturing that and 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 having that i think is is paramount like i think that's the the the, where what we're heading into and i think we'll be yeah yeah what's going to be the success stories for artists and we're already seeing um Artist smashing it like through this, you know, and uh, it's it's awesome. Is is your um, when we met last year? Um, I I I noticed that you were doing some work with Vice, and you now have your own company called Cosmo Media, and so there's you you have obviously a history with partnerships in and brand brand partnerships with artists and music and labels, and is that what Cosmo Media does? Is it both? Is it sort of helping people? Yeah, tell me a bit about what Cosmo Media does, and and what's the is there? And are you doing? Are your clients involved? And are you working with clients and projects that are that are Web three related? Yeah, so so yeah, so Cosmo Media is is my vehicle for for kind of you know creative connections in music. Um, you know whether that is working with artists and helping them kind of, you know, connect with brands or whether that is, you know, working with brands and helping them develop uh, interesting, you know, music campaigns and, and connecting with the music industry in, in a more kind of meaningful way. Um, you know, I, I kind of play both sides in that respect. Uh, you know, I've worked, uh, you know, i worked with um, Paradigm in London, um, the booking agency that is now Wasserman and, uh, you mm-hmm. know, sort of headed up their commercial team, um, you know, representing artists like Billie Eilish and Shawn Mendes and Imagine Dragons and, and you know, kind of helping brands connect with those artists in, in interesting ways. And, and, of course, you know, artists of that caliber, you know, they're, they're able to be very, uh, very picky in who they work with uh, and the sorts of creative campaigns that they get involved in. Um, so, so very much working with brands and helping them you know, kind of approach those artists in, in a meaningful way and, and to help those deals come together ultimately. Mm. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, there, there are a lot of artists out there who are looking for, you know, I guess, yeah, financial support from, from the, the brand space and from the advertising space, um, especially, you know, independent artists. And, and, you know, there's, you know, working with brands is, 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 is a really difficult thing, especially when, you know, you want to be a creative artist and you want to be uncompromising on your creativity and, you know, you've got your own message to, to sort of get across to your fans. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, being an artist and connecting with one of those brands through a campaign will allow that artist to, to reach a wider audience as well. So there's always a, a balance there in terms of, you know, what the brand wants and, and what the artist needs, um, what the brand needs and what the artist wants. Um, and, and a lot of variables, you know, they, they kind of sit in the middle. So, so yeah, with Cosmo Media, I'm trying to, you know, take from, you know, a lot from what I've learned about working in the music industry. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, having worked a lot with licensing music for TV commercials and working with brands to, to yeah, help help their campaigns feel a bit more authentic when they're when they're using the power of music. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting space, um, you know, working with Vice and working on the, the, uh, the music conference that, that we did, 
uh, in the Middle East, you know, that was, you know, again, using the power of music for, for creating connections and, and to create a, a meaningful and, and vibrant music industry in the Middle East, you know. And, and again, you know, kind of learning a lot of the things that I learned in the early 2000s about kind of bringing people together and creating meaningful connections and giving people a different, you know, different path into the world, you know, mm-hmm. through creativity, I think is, is a really powerful way to, to empower people, um, in, you know, through creativity and through music. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's something that I, I learned, you know, as we said, through the kind of DIY way. Um, I think that, you know, looking forward in, into how brands uh, are going to be able to support the music industry, I think more than ever, you know, brands can play an incredibly, uh, you know, powerful uh, way in in helping the the kind of yeah I guess emerging artists and, and middle tier artists you know you look at statistics from Spotify a hundred thousand you know new tracks being uploaded every month and you know but I mean what is it like one percent five percent I don't know the statistic but you know what let's say one percent of Spotify's you know kind of artists are, are supporting you know the rest of the platform and. Mm. It's, you know, brands can play, you know, um, a, a very important role in continuing the development and continuing the, the vibrancy of the music industry and creative industries. Um, and not just going for, you know, oh, we want to do a campaign with Billie Eilish or Shawn Mendes or, you know, Ellie Goulding or, or these huge artists, you know, they can play a really meaningful role in empowering communities. Uh, and empowering the the kind of the, the vibrancy of those creative industries, and and I think it's a really interesting time for that, you know, especially as so many brands are looking at the metaverse and looking at Web three and looking at ways that they can engage with these people. And it's just like, well, you know, like it's all well and good looking at these new technologies, but actually, you you also need to look at how you can sustain, you know, how brands can sustain the industry as well, because you know we need headliners that are going to be being supported now but are going to be headliners in five or ten years you know you talk to so many booking agents and so many festival bookers and you know they are like well who are going to be the headliners when when the you know this current raft of headliners kind of become old or retire or die or you know that like they can't book them again because they booked them two years ago you know Mm. And and I think that there's a lot of people aside from the music industry that have a responsibility to keep the creative communities, you know, afloat because, you know, there aren't very many people making money through Spotify and making money mm. through YouTube. And and again, I think, you know, what you said about the Web3 thing is really important because it allows artists to kind of go, well, hey, great, actually, you know, creating connections and creating my own career from my own network is more important than just like reach and followers that don't really translate to anything really meaningful. Mm. Mm. Um, so, exactly. so yeah, that was a really long way of saying, you know, yeah, Cosmo is great and, and you know, <laughs> being able to bring these people together, um, both artists and, and, and brands. Um, but, you know, I think that there's a bigger, a bigger message there. It's about the sustainability of the music industry as a whole. Mm. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the current kind of streaming sort of model that, that is dominating headlines and dominating, you know, kind of like revenue numbers for labels and things like that. It's only really benefiting the, the top tier. Um, and, mm. and I think something can be done, you know, from brands who look at the kind of emerging and middle tier that will create a sustainable, sustainable industry for the future, for sure. I, and from like from what I gather, it, it there um the you know now post COVID um, brands are um you know still um there, but it's not it's not the same as sort of pre you know two thousand and nineteen in terms of what's available in terms of funding and and like it it it's still brand partnerships are moving and starting to happen, but. What, what's your take on that? Um, I think that, you know, brands, I think for brands, right, when they're investing in the music industry, it's, it's risky, 
you know, they're, they're looking into a world that they don't necessarily understand and they don't exist in, aside from, you know, uh, a, a very, you know, very few brands where music is really part of their DNA. Um, you know, you want to look at examples like, I don't know, Converse or Dr. Martins or, um, Red Bull, for example, you know, the, these brands, you know, they've really put culture and music at the heart of their brand. And, and I think that, you know, for them, investing in the music industry is, is less risky because, you know, it's part of their DNA already. And, you know, I guess the finest example of, of, you know, brands existing in the music space and contributing to culture in a meaningful way is, is Red Bull and the Red Bull Music Academy, which, which, you know, finished a couple of years ago. But, you know, that was, I think, 20 years of consistent investment in, right. in the music industry and in developing artists and developing culture. And, and bringing, you know, giving artists an opportunity and a platform, you know, through the studios or through the events or through the content. Um, you know, it was astounding really that, mm. that a brand would do that, but you know, it's part of their DNA. So it made sense. Right. Mm. Whereas, you know, I think marketing managers at brands these days, I say these days, I think this is something that, that has been going on for a long time, but. You know, they're, they're just looking for a campaign that is going to, you know, get their brand, um, you know, some, some, some increased, increased brand experience and increased sales. And, you know, yeah, we're going to do a big festival and we're going to do content and we're going to get a big headline artist to, you know, to be the ambassador for, for our brand. And then two years later, there's a new marketing manager that comes in and says, I will now want to do something different. And they'll go into fashion or they'll go into, you know, uh, mm. you know, art or design or something else and and so it's really difficult i think for brands to have a meaningful role when when they're just trying to do it through a campaign and as we know brands they'll you know they'll have a campaign every year and it'll have a different message and it'll have a different audience mm. and it's it, you need to have that consistency to build mm you know, trust in the music industry and build trust with artists and build trust with, with ultimately consumers, right? And, and so I think that, you know, at the moment after COVID, uh, especially brands that did exist a lot in the music space or in the event space or were headlining festivals, you know, headline sponsoring festivals or things like that, you know, um, I think now it's probably, I mean, maybe not so much now, but, you know, it was quite risky for them, you know, because if you're going to invest in a big festival sponsorship and, and that festival perhaps goes out of business, you know, it's a really tough time for the live market at the moment. Um, or, you know, there's a possibility of a cancellation or COVID coming back or there being another, another barrier for, for, for the, the live events industry. Um, you know, it's, it's risky for brands, you know, which is why I think perhaps a lot of them are looking at the metaverse and looking at kind of, online because perhaps they feel like they can control they can control those events yeah, a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. you know there isn't such a big mm. risk um but but i think you know but again like if, if all if every brand starts exist you know starts existing in and investing in the metaverse you know what's going to happen to how are festivals going to continue to happen without those big headline sponsors you know, how are, mm. you know, upcoming and middle tier artists going to exist without those content opportunities and those sponsorship opportunities? Um, you know, and so, mm. so I think it raises a really interesting point of, you know, kind of, yeah, how brands want to connect with consumers in the music industry and the creative industries and, and the risks that they want to take and that they're prepared to take, mm. you know, um, and, and sort of, how how we as people in the music industry can help develop trust for brands and say, hey, you know, the music the music space is trustworthy, artists are trustworthy. You know, you're not going to get ripped off. You're not going to let get left at the altar when the brand, uh, you know, when the artist runs off with the money and doesn't deliver the Instagram post that they did, you know, that they were supposed to on the contract. Mm. Um, so I think we've all got a responsibility here to try to, you know, help brands feel that the music space is is a trustworthy space to exist in and mm. then to highlight the different spaces where you know where brands can help 
Um, and I think the, the live aspect of that, live events, live touring, you know, there's some really interesting examples at the moment where, you know, artists have pulled out of touring because they can't afford to go on tour. Um, and, you know, there's a, and these, the, you know, uh, the, the things that I've read are, you know, about American artists, you know, coming to Europe. Um, I think there was an example of an animal collective, you know, sort of saying that it's just not economically feasible to, for them to go on tour in Europe. And yes, that's Brexit and that's cost of living and that, you know, numerous different variables that, that, you know, have inhibited artists, you know, going on tour. But, you know, if I'm a marketing manager, I'll be like, well, great. How do I, you know, how do I step in and help animal collective get on tour? Maybe Animal Collective aren't the best example because, you know, they're artists that are very specific and protective of their artistry. Um, and maybe, you know, again, but again, this raises another important point, you know, is what do artists need to do to sort of say, well, hey, look, if we want to go on tour, maybe we do need to compromise a little bit um, to mm. be able to get that support and that engagement from brands too. Um, so so I think it's it's a really interesting space because all these all these opportunities for brands are opening up to support the music community. Uh, and, and, you know, again, like artists need to think twice, well, hey, look, if we want this funding and we want this support, you know, what do we need to do to compromise a little bit too? Um, and, you know, I want to try to facilitate those, those conversations because I know how powerful it is to have in real life events and in real life connection with people, you know, because that's how we're here you know, talking right now, um, you know, I don't want to be having my conversations in the metaverse through an avatar, you know, where I'm like, well, am I talking to, you know, 22 year old or a 52 year old? Who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I know, you know, in, in my heart that those meaningful, those meaningful connections in real life are going to be the connections that sustain the, the music industry and the creative industries, because I think that that's what they're built on. Um, yeah. So yeah, getting a bit philosophical here. No, 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 no. I think it's know. perfect. I think it's a perfect. I actually did want to talk to you about relationship building and and how important it is in in this industry, and and fostering those relationships and and you know, um, a big part of this uh, um, uh, industry has been all about that. And and I think uh, it's important that that these uh, fundamentals uh, are, are maintained. You know, we need to keep keep those things. And look, I'm all for technology, to, I mean, and, and even um, the idea of jumping in a metaverse meeting because I can't get on a plane and fly over to Ibiza to meet with uh, someone tomorrow. I can do that. You know, if that you know there are those things, and uh, I think, um, but yeah. I I I think it's as long as we don't lose sight of that, and because it's so tempting and so you know, um, it's easy to you know, and and that's been a big I think part of the problem over over the the last twenty years with social media is is that it, that it's um so addictive, <laughs> and and yeah, there's, there's an addiction. There's an addiction. You know, it's it's a very short lived addiction, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think that it's yeah. That there's you know there's a real challenge. Um, I remember being in a in a in a conference room a couple of years ago, and you know there was a 16 year old uh, woman who uh, was basically saying that the the peer pressure to be engaged with social media. 24 seven meant that, you know, that, that she was, you know, sitting up all night on, on WhatsApp and Instagram, you know, because she had to be part of the conversation so that at school the next day, you know, that, that, that she knew what people were talking about. And if, you know, and if she didn't know, then she was kind of isolated from the group, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and this, this kind of peer pressure of, of, of connection, um, I think, I think is very dangerous. And, and I think that also it doesn't allow for, it doesn't allow for, for personal connections to flourish in, in real life because it's, it's always based on the, the material, you know, from, from 
um, you know, from online and social media. You know, that's the the, the sort of the cultural currency, right? Is, mm. is is you know what meme and what what channel and what celebrity and and I think that yeah, you know, connecting in real life through the love of music or the love of art, or, you know, the love of connection, the love of sharing. Um, you know, I'm not saying that that can't be done online, but you know, I believe again through my own experience. Of, of you know developing you know developing my sense of self and developing my personality through those you know through those music events that I was going to in my you know early twenties late teens early twenties mm. you know it it sort of allowed for what I believe more meaningful and and more meaningful and deep connections and and friendships that that have stood the test of time, right? And mm. and I think that you know, yeah, in in twenty years' time, if we can look back and say, okay, great, you know, how how many uh, how many friends do young people have now from who they you know made connections with twenty years ago online through the metaverse? You know, mm. I think you know, will it be the same way that we look back and oh, I'm still you know connecting with that person who I met on MSN in two thousand and two? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's sort of like, uh, yeah, I, I think it'll be a really interesting comparison to make. Um, but, but again, I, I do, I do worry about the limits of of social media and the limits of of online connection versus in real life. Mm. Um, and and I know, yeah, I, I believe no, but I believe that the the power of of music will continue to bring bring people back into real life because i think sharing those moments with people you know i look at ar and vr at the moment and some of the technology that's coming through about you know being able to stream you know stream a concert um in in ar um or vr and it's just like yeah great the 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 technology's there but i'm going to have this experience on my own Mm -hmm. you know it doesn't matter whether i'm immersed in you know, having like, uh, um, you know, the, the sort of the feel of a, of a concert environment in my living room. And, but, you know, ultimately it's still just an individual experience. And, and, you know, we're not able to really, you know, the, the richness of experience is through sharing. And, and I think that, you know, it's really difficult to share an experience when you're online. Yeah. Um, and, you know, versus, versus in real life, I think. Uh, so yeah, it brings up a lot of challenges. And, and I think, you know, again, brands can play a huge part in communicating the importance of these things. You know, yeah, of course, if they want to exist in the metaverse, great, but, you know, remind your audience and remind your consumers how powerful and how meaningful it can be in, in connecting with people in real life as well. Um, you know, we've all got a responsibility, right? Because if we just drive everyone online and everyone into the metaverse, you know, I, I think it, you know, we might sort of look back and be like, mm, did we do the right thing there? Mm. You know, did we have a responsibility for people's mental health and wellness to remind them to get outside? And yeah, great, come and in, come and experience us in the metaverse, but make sure you go for a walk in nature after. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It it it's I feel like there's going to be um because if if anything we did see what it could potentially look like based on um you know this two two year gap where we were all forced to be online and and live that way and it I feel like already we're seeing new industries and new skills that are emerging to help people learn how to connect with humanity again. And that seems like that's going to be a whole other industry that's forming as well. Like there's, we're, you know, we're seeing um, coaching, we're seeing all these, um, if we go down the whole sort of spiritual stuff as well, there's all these sort of um, industries that are emerging in that space to help people learn how to be human again. (laughs) It, it, that's, yeah, yeah. No, I mean you're you're right, but but I think there's there's a, there's a real irony there that we're 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 trying to help people and educate people, you know, through the internet on how to be well, right? <laughs> and it's just like you know what, man, like 
turn off your computer, go for a walk. You know, that's yeah. you know, that's the best education I could probably give anybody. <laughs> um, you know, at least at least as a start. Yeah. You know? And then I would go, and then I would say, you know, while you're on that walk, call up a friend who you haven't spoken to for a long time, mm-hmm. or you know, call up your mum or your dad and tell them how great it is to walk in nature and how much you miss. Them. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know getting a bit silly but but you know i i think that you know yes there's there's an incredible opportunity to be able to help people understand what tools are out there and you know the power of music and wellness for example but i think that the the real power is in connecting with people Mm. and and i think that you know yes it's great that we can do you know amazing breathwork sessions online and we can you know, live stream from an ayahuasca retreat in Brazil, you know, for example. But like, again, these, these experiences that people are, are having through these online, um, tools, you know, it's, again, it's, 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 for me, there's a glass ceiling there, you know, that, that mm-hmm. the, the, at the end of every online session, it should be, okay, we've connected online. Now go outside and do the yeah. same thing with a friend yeah. of yours, you know, or, yeah. you know, there has to be a responsibility, you know, instead of us like, oh, great, we had 4,000 people come into our live stream today and experience our breathwork session. Great, amazing. Our, our Instagram engagement stats have gone through the roof. Incredible. You know, we're getting these brand partnerships because of our engagement stats and our followers. Amazing. But, you know, it's the responsibility that we have to these people who are engaging with these channels and with these spiritual healers and with these coaches and, you know, with these online wellness personalities, you know, uh, and, and I think that, you know, we're sort of, I, I certainly feel that, that a lot of people are getting, you know, caught up in, in, in again, you know, the followers and the engagement and they're kind of like, yeah, great. I'm, mm-hmm. You know, I've got this many people, you know, coming to my online session, you know, and once we turn off, we're like, okay, great. Yeah, I've done my, I've done my work. I'm, I'm a successful, um, I'm a successful online coach, and I'm helping people, you know, connect with themselves in a better way by connecting to my Instagram channel. It's like it's, it, I don't know. It just, it just makes me. Yeah, you know, again, it, I'm like, no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I can, uh, I, I totally, um, you know, resonate with what you're saying. Like, I, I think that there's a. Um, there's a fine line here, right? And it can be very blurry. Um, you know, uh, but artists, but- you know, I think artists have got a real, real responsibility to their followers. You know, mm. Um, mm. you know, we again, it's sort of the, the focus on growth and the focus on followers and the focus on likes, and the focus on engagement. Um, you know, it's. It's great, you know, because it's sustaining create, you know, careers for creative people. Mm. Um, but at what at what cost, you know? Mm. And mm. and I think that you know, yeah, there's, you know, <laughs> it would be really interesting to be able to say, well, you know, yeah, you have a responsibility for your followers. You know, they're not mm. just followers to sustain your, you know, private jet lifestyle. You know, yeah. it's, you've got you've got a responsibility to help these people as well. Help them understand the, the the challenges that they might that they might come up against by spending so much time online in your metaverse. And are these the conversations since you're you know you're a brand partnership specialist? I mean, like this is um, is these these are the, are these the conversations and concerns that brands are bringing up as well? Like when they want and or, and and vice versa, like with the artists, like they're trying to sort of find new ways to do, to be in the music space, you know, and, 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 cons- and considering all these new um, things that we have to be aware of, you know, from, from relationship yeah, I think, and community. I think that brands, brands are starting to see the power, you know, um, We've seen we've seen a lot of brands focus on you know kind of headline talent, headline ambassador partnerships, and and I think you know and in, you know in the influencer world a couple of years ago you know sort of dominated the marketing and advertising headlines, you know um, you know influencers were the 
were the, the sort of the, the way in for brands. And I think now, now brands have started to realize that, well, we can't just have an influencer with a lot of followers. You know, we need to, we need to bring in a community of influencers that, you know, that, that have um, a, a respect and, and a responsibility in a community of people. So we're starting to see brands start to value communities of people um, a, a little bit more than an influencer that has a lot of followers, you know, because that uh, I think, you know, consumers and, and, um, and people who are, you know, yeah, target audience for a brand are becoming a lot more savvy. And mm. they sort of see through brands just, trying to do a bit of a land grab on like, mm. hey, we need to get as many followers as possible. We need to get this this Instagram influencer to, you know, use our product in one of their posts. Um, you know, and there's some regulations are, around now that, you know, about sort of, you know, putting an ad, you know, putting a, a, an ad hashtag on a, on a sponsored post or something like that to help to, you know, mm. help consumers understand, well, you know, is this paid for or is this organic? Um, mm. But I think now the, the kind of conversation has moved one step further now where brands kind of can't just, well, certainly not authentically anyway, can't just grab, you know, an influencer with a lot of followers and, and you know, give them some products and, and get them to do an Instagram post. You know, people will see right through that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I yeah. think brands now are starting to look at, well, okay, how can we, how can we empower communities? Um, you know, how can we help communities thrive? through you know using the brand or you know the power of the brand's platform uh, or the brand's reach to be able to help empower that community a little bit more mm. so things are progressing um you know uh, i've already used the word authentic once in this conversation <laughs> i only use it once more but you know it's the authentic, the authenticity of of communications from brands is conscious is conscious communication to- <laughs> yeah, you know, but but you know, not at the detriment of, you know, they've still got to sell the product, right? Mm. And and so it, it's trying to find a balance there, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier about you know, kind of brands that exist, you know, in the music space. You know, where I said you look at Red Bull, you look at Vans, you look at um, Dr. Martens. You know, it's kind of they will continue to turn up in the music space because it's relevant to them and relevant to their brand. Um, mm. And they can have, you know, meaningful conversations in that space because they've existed in there for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 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 I think the brands, you know, the the message that that you can give to brands is like, well, if you want to exist in the music space, this isn't a two year campaign. You know, this is a five year campaign. This is a ten year campaign. Mm. You know, or music doesn't fit into your DNA. You know, just because you're like, oh, great, everyone's moving into music and the metaverse and let's get involved in that. And in two years time, we're going to pivot and do something else again. It's just like, you know, people are going to see through that. Mm. So, so stick to stick to what is authentic to your brand. And if it's not music, that's OK. You mm. know, but go and find go and find what it is. I think mm. it's going to be really difficult for, a, you know, um, a, a sort of margarine spread brand to turn up in culture. Authentically. <laughs> but they are trying. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know where I was going. I mean, so, well, no, but sometimes, no, but I, 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 there, you, sometimes you see certain brands that surprise me and you're like, yeah, that, that's kind of cool. Um, and, and it works, you know, sometimes it like total left field kind of brands come jumping in the space that you just like, wow. Okay. Um, and it, and there's, there's a, there's a tongue in cheek sort of thing to it, you know, like who knows? <laughs> a, a, a margin. Yeah, it kind of makes sense, but it, <laughs> but it does seem quite gimmicky, and and if it's gimmicky, yeah. it, it won't last very long, right? Mm. Um, and and it, you know, it's 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 a it's a campaign based on on a gimmick, and again, you know, it's great and it's fun, and it's you know, it it, it can be interesting for people, um, but you know, they're going to have to come up with something, you know, even more interesting the next year and the next year after that, and and I think at some point. You know, it doesn't get tiring for, for brands and for advertising agencies to keep coming up with these really, you know, kind of cute and, and subversive ideas instead of just going, you know what, like, let's build a five year plan, you know, that, that will build legacy and that will, will create meaningful connection and that will allow 
artists and the creative communities communities to thrive. You know, what what, a, what an incredible brainwave that might be. Instead of just like, okay, great, what's the gimmick and what's the tagline and how do we get, you know, how do we get, you know, a good review on, you know, marketing week, you know, for our camp, you know, how do we get campaign of the week? It's just like, how do you get, you know, a campaign of the last five years? You know, it's a switch from from that short term mentality to long term mentality, mm. um, and and that real contribution. Um, and, I, and I think that there's a huge space now. You know, there's a huge space for brands to step into mm. um, that that can fill that gap because, yeah, as I've said, you know, during this conversation, there are a lot of challenges out there for the music industry and for artists. Um, that means that there might not be so many live artists in five or ten years. Yeah. And that's the biggest tragedy here, you know, um, mm-hmm. that, that I don't think anyone's really talking about at the moment. You know, we're starting to see the cracks appear in, you know, tours being cancelled because artists can't, can't afford to do it. Um, or the same headline is appearing on, on, you know, similar festivals year after year. Uh, you know, the yeah. cracks are starting to appear a bit. Like I said, you know, the, the top percentage of Spotify artists you know, it's sort of the, the sort of the, the gap is appearing and it's very, it's, it's, it's very obvious to people in the music industry, but maybe not so obvious to people outside of that. Mm. Um, so I think, first of all, it's an awareness that that, that that gap is there and that gap is widening. Mm. And, and what is the space that we saw that, that this summer? And- we, we saw that this summer, like a lot of the festivals were like almost identical. Like, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I cut you off there. But, but I was no, just, no, yeah, no. I it's, wanted it's, to echo what you were saying, yeah. And, and I think next year is going to be going to be even more challenging for, for, for live events and for festivals, both for headliners and both for, you know, ticket sales and for sponsorships. And, you know, it's, it's becoming a really, I wouldn't want to be a, a festival owner. Or a promoter. In, well, they have in a the responsibility too, though, right? They've like the festival promoters. Um, they're they're um, th- they have to be um, willing to sort of take those risks, and um, you know they don't need to be doing the same programming. There's there are some festivals that are doing doing a great job with that still. Um, mm. Let's yeah, the ones that the ones that are usually doing the, the most interesting programming are the what are the independent ones, right? Yes. Exactly. Um, otherwise, you know, you've got your, you know, AGs and your Live Nations, you know, the kind of cookie cutting similar festivals or, or, you know, buying up the most interesting festivals, um, and homogenizing them to some extent because, mm. you know, they know that the masses exist in that middle tier and they, and they don't go to the edges of creativity or the edges of kind of music genres so much. Mm. Um, so we're leaving all the risk. The, the biggest risk to those independent promoters and those independent festival owners that, you know, I know festival owners that have lost their house, multiple houses over multiple years, you know, because they believe in putting on a festival is more important than, than you know, owning, owning bricks and mortar. And, you know, mm. I mean, that is risk and that is living, right? But we can't have people kind of dying at, dying at their sword you know, and, and, and the Live Nations and the AEGs just continue to, to sort of, you know, make, make the money. Mm. Um, it is know, part of course, the, the base but you need, of it. You need, you know, you need the Live Nations and things like that to support the music industry to some extent. But they're, you know, they're, again, they're, they're supporting the top tier. Mm. Um, mm. So all the risk is going to, to the people at the bottom. Um, yeah. And yeah. So and that's, that's what happened, right? right? It's, it, it's like, um, that that the, and I guess it's we've seen that pattern in 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 the music industry from you know if we just look back at like the 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 history of electronic music it's like um, people putting in and the the putting in the work and creating this whole industry and then mm-hmm. others come in and just swoop it up <laughs> just. The, you know, well, and- yeah, the, the business techno term is, is kind of dominating a lot of conversations at the moment, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, you know, electronic and underground music, you know, it was, it was very much seen as a, as a subculture, 
Um, and, you know, now you look at radio play across the world and electronic music is dominating it's on the rise. You know, radio play and mm. dominating, you know, sort of chart position. That's right. And, and you know, it, it's, it's coming it's up. Having it's its own. Now it's coming up. Mm. Well, and, and, you know, I had read somewhere that, that hip hop is actually, you know, starting a decline. That's right. Um, and, and I think, you know, and, you know, rock music will come back and folk mm. music will come back and singer songwriter music will come back. And, you know, it all has its, its cycles, right? Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's sort of, you know, it's being aware of those cycles, of course. But it's also being aware of like, well, you know, we can't just continue to support the top tier of, of record labels and artists and promoters and festival owners, mm. um, you know, because it is, it's, it's, it's being, you know, the whole industry is being squeezed and COVID especially um, was a huge catalyst uh, in, 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 you know, intensifying that squeeze for, for the independent and DIY community. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and if we're not careful, you know, there aren't, you know, there aren't going to be the fringes and experimental artists and the experimental events, yes. and the experimental festivals that, you know, a lot of people, you know, love, but don't necessarily go to, you know, they, they lo everyone loves to, to kind of, you know, identify or, or, you know, sort of say, oh yeah, I've heard this, you know, really interesting thing, but if you don't go and buy the merch and if you don't go to the gig, you know, when they're at three or 400 people and, and, you know, you don't go and support that artist somehow, you know, then, then they're not going to be around in, in two or three mm. years time. Um, you know, and, and if you want to go and buy that, you know, that ticket to Coachella or that ticket to Glastonbury, I mean, Glastonbury is actually not, not a good example. I want to retract that <laughs> because, you know, they, they do support, you know, the grassroots in a big way. Mm. Um, but, but I think, you know, we need to, you know, as consumers, we need to, to also spread our interests because if we just go with what's being playlisted on Radio 1 and we're just going with the chart, you know, the chart sort of positions of the week and supporting those artists, mm. You know, the the next tier of artists aren't going to be here. In, I think in I think with time. um the 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 um uh the way the music industry is now in terms of um you know stream you know uh, digital streaming distribution channels and um the way it is 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 that where um the 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 for electronic music in particular, like for independent electronic music, the, that model has to be a DIY approach because, like it with Web three, it's there's something punk rock about it, right? Like there's something like it's a little bit, uh, you know, against the man. <laughs> um, and that's, I yeah, guess no, that's there is there is yeah that's that's the refreshing part about it. Like that's I yeah. think well um, I think that's where the, there's hope. And that's where we see where there's still going to be or that authenticity. <laughs> yeah. 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 There, there is hope. And, yeah, and listen, I realized that a lot of the things that, that I've said, you know, are of, you know, have a dystopian theme to it. <laughs> um, and, and I, and I do, and I do believe that, you know, the, the new technologies, particularly web three and discord, you know, brings the power back to the artist. Mm. Um, I, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm, I have been more speaking about kind of, you know, brands in, yes. in how, you know, they can, they can pivot their thinking and pivot their marketing spend into supporting areas Which is of relevant. the that, industry that, that, that really that, do need it. Yeah. Right? Looking through that lens is relevant as Ooh. well, because it's important to understand that other dynamic that exists and that's... Mm -hmm the world that you're in and you've been seeing that like and trying to create healthy brand partnerships and healthy yeah, uh, right. results. Yeah. This, now, yeah. is that what that is that the focus behind Cos Cosmo, um, Cosmos, Cosmo Media? Uh, I mean, you know what? It's not the pure focus for sure. Um, you know, I'm, I'm involved in some other projects as well um, that, that aren't brand focused. Uh, mm. I've been working on a project called the Global Music Vault, which is 
mm. um, based in the same area as the, the Global Seed Vault, um, the, the Doomsday Vault that, that some people know of it, um, which is based in Svalbard in Norway, you know, and, and you know, trying to help people understand that the protecting music is, is, is a really important um, uh, aspect that we need to focus on. Um, okay. and, and I think that, you know, it's sort of, yeah, working with brands is important, but also, you know, it's, you know, we all, we all need to be aware of, of the other dangers. And one of the big dangers is, is, you know, kind of protecting music in some respect, you know, if again, the same way that I was talking earlier about artists putting all of their power into their fans on, you know, Instagram and their fans on TikTok, for example, you know, if we put the responsibility of protecting the world's music to Spotify and, you know, that all of the world's music is on this platform called Spotify or this platform called Apple Music or this platform called Deezer or Hang Harmony, you know, um, what happens when those platforms decide that it's no longer viable for their business to run and they decide to close down, you know, um, what happens to all of that, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, the, the sort of the, the music that, that isn't commercial music and that is owned by record labels. You know, mm. what happens? How do we protect that, for example? Um, mm. And I think with the Global Music Vault, we're trying to raise, raise awareness of, you know, protecting music and, you know, with archives and with institutions around the world that are lacking funding in protecting music. Um, and, I, and I mean, protecting, you know, the, the sort of the physical physical pieces of music, whether that is old vinyl or whether that is old DAT tapes or, you know, whether that is old, you know, video footage of indigenous tribes in Africa, you know, performing, um, you know, kind of tribal, you know, relevant songs, you know, for, for mm. their communities. Um, you know, what happens when everything goes online and what happens when everything goes to a server and what happens when that server crashes and, you know, what happened with MySpace? They lost millions and millions of, of, of pieces of music, you mm. know, and it just disappears. Mm. You know, what happens if, if the same thing happens with Spotify or, or people just lose interest in Spotify? Is Spotify going to have a, a, a moral um, responsibility to, to keep that music live? Because that is a, is a focus point of, of, of culture for, for humanity. No, mm. I think Spotify will be like, hey, you know what? We need to turn these servers off because it's not, we, we can't afford to keep them running anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's these important things as well that, that I'm trying to focus on um, and bring awareness to. And, and again, perhaps there's, you know, there's a space for brands to be able to, to be part to of that have a responsibility mm. to, to, mm. to say, well, hey, look, we want to we wanna help keep music alive. Um, mm. We want to help create. Um, safe places for culture and and safe storage facilities for music you know mm -hmm. there was a, a well-documented example of a, a universal music fire uh a, a, a warehouse that was owned by universal music uh, in i think it was in la in the 2007 or 2008 where you know numerous master tapes and master files were lost and and you know the responsibility of protecting music is is with a private organization you know and and a lot of those a lot of those master tapes and original tapes were lost um i understand that a third of all um silent films were lost in in that same fire mm. um i would need to be fact checked on the on these things that that was my understanding but you know there's a lot of really important cultural moments that exist in music and exist in film and the responsibility of protecting those things is, is with private organizations that, that don't necessarily have the music, um, to protect, you know, they're like, well, we'll only protect it as long as we own it. And then afterwards, you know, doesn't, you know, we're not sure what happens to it and, yeah. and do we have a responsibility and should there be, you know, an independent organization that, that is, that is, has the responsibility to protect music. And so the global music fall, we've, we've, we have a partnership with, um, the International Music Council that is kind of UNESCO's kind of, um, uh, music, uh, uh, arm, I suppose you could call it. Uh, and, you know, they, they have the, 
you know, certainly have a responsibility to to ensure that that you know music and culture is is being protected for generations. Mm. Um, and and you know, but again, like they're not private organisations, so they rely on funding from you know the European Union, and they rely from funding from um, you know philanthropists and and private individuals. Uh, and and you know, perhaps there's a space for brands to to look at more interesting ways that they can you know support culture and support the music industry. You know, mm-hmm. again, for generations, and not just for you know a, a, a one year or a two year campaign, for example. Yeah. Um. So that's what that's what I you know I feel you know personally um, that I'm moving towards now is is yes, there's a commercial element to working with brands, a commercial element to, to helping artists, but also I think that there's a wider responsibility that that we have in order to you know protecting music and heritage and, and culture for generations as well. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a uh, super interesting, um, I, uh, you're, you're in, you're, you're based out of Ibiza now. Is that the, is that, is that a new home for you? And are you finding it, um, suitable for, 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 you know, for your work and, and as a good hub, obviously it's a place for electronic music, but, um, one of the, you know, meccas of electronic yeah. music. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's uh, there's there's some lovely contrast to Ibiza, which is you know the party island and and the, the international party destination. You know, from from June until September, um, and there's also you know a very beautiful and quiet part of the island as well, where there is a lot of nature and and a lot of tranquility. Um, that, that it kind of exists, uh, for, for the sort of the off season. Um, I guess that was one of the beauties of lockdown. You know, I'd lived in London for 20 years and, and yeah, sort of, you know, the music industry sort of forced me to be in the music industry. Uh, and I think, you know, the sort of the, the lockdown allowed a lot of people to work remotely. Um, and so I took that opportunity and, and yeah, I found it really difficult to kind of, Think about going back into you know into the big cities, um, but you know Ibiza has you know um, a lot of great examples of communities as well, and you know there's a lot of DJs here, there's a lot of artists, there's a lot of promoters, there's a lot of music industry people that live here, so it kind of allows me to have the best of both worlds, uh, which has been really great for me and really great for my own uh, mental well-being uh, as well, and um, and yeah, so. So I'm going to continue to try and uh, and live that double life and you know come back into the world, come back to Europe when I need to. Um, but but yeah, it's been it's been really great to to sort of experience the last couple of years here and then and and really start to look at you know the the music industry from a little bit of an outside perspective. You know, looking back in and looking looking at, at what's happening. Um, and hopefully that allows me to have a bit more of a better perspective when I'm talking to people. Yeah. Um, in 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 how you know how we can communicate and how we can contribute to you know creating a better music industry and a better creative community uh, and, and and a better sort of society for artists as well. Um, and so yeah, Ibiza is a great place for that. Um, and there's great. a lot of interesting discussions here on you know wellness and. And, you know, saving humanity and, you know, there's a lot of dreamers and spiritual healers here and, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of that side too, which is, which is really interesting. Um, but then, you know, a lot of big promoters and a lot of big artists and, a lot of, you know, millionaires decide to, to come and call this place home as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it offers a, a really interesting contrast. Um, and, and I think that there's a, a lot of really great ideas and a lot of innovation. That is that is coming from Ibiza as well, uh, and I think that you know the, the sort of the opportunities for for doing things differently, um, and, you know, and and again you look at the impact that the music industry has on the island for for three or four months a year, and um, and that's also really challenging, you know, having a seasonal island that goes from a few hundred thousand people to you know up to I think two million at any one time. Mm-hmm. In, in kind of July and August, Amazing. you know, it puts huge mm-hmm. pressures on the environment, puts huge mm-hmm. pressures on water sources, puts huge pressure on 
on you know um, communities of people. You know, there's a lot of people here are finding it difficult to recruit um, you know hospitality workers because they can't afford to live here, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know there's there's a lot of challenges as well that I think the music industry needs to be aware of as well. Um, and so you know there's a lot of questions, but I know that there's a lot of solutions as well. And and yet being in a place like this, you know, allows me to have a bit more space to to think about how how I can, you know, support people um, to the best way that I can too. Lawrence, it was fantastic to catch up with you. This has been a really great conversation. I'm going to add uh, the links to um, your projects, Cosmo Media, in the in the show notes. Um, is right, there thanks. Anything- thanks yeah, is there any are there any other uh, places that you can tell the listeners is best to find you? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the website, uh, cosmo-media.net is the best place. Um, it's got a list of the projects that I'm working on. And, and, and yeah, that, that, that's the best place to go. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks, James, for, for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, I've, uh, since we've met, I've had a lot of, um, a lot of time to, to go back and listen to some of your shows. And, Thank you. And, yeah, really love the way that, that you're – that you're sort of bringing awareness to and, and promoting all different aspects of, Thanks, of, of the music industry and not just electronic as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, electronic music, you know, is, is how we became here. But I think, you know, as I said, you know, electronic music is now commercial music. Um, That's right. You know, I think that, you know, we're talking about the music industry as a whole now, and I think that you're shining a light into a lot of places that, that perhaps some other podcasts are not. Um, I appreciate uh, I that. Thank you. Yeah, really, really great. Um, really great work you're doing. So I Thank you, mate. That. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lawrence, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Take right. care. Cheers, James. All right. Bye-bye. You too, mate.